So before we uh, get into our lesson, which is John chapter 13, I've asked uh, uh, Clyde to give a testimony, an update on his activities. Well, I must say, uh, I appreciate the invitation to come to your Bible study and the opportunity to know you from the time we were probably in the sixth grade. Right. And to each of you, greetings. I'm extremely grateful for my mother who taught me the scriptures and to know Jesus Christ from a young age. And uh, even though some challenges through the teenage years, and then at General Motors, a man named Arby Clay, a black man, said to another fellow worker, you're going to hell. I said, well, Arby, you shouldn't tell people they're going to hell. He said, well, you're going to hell too if you don't change. <laughs> <laughs> that really impacted me. And I've learned that the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord, the same as the beginning of wisdom. And from that, we transitioned to the love of God and want to share Christ. And that's what I was doing across the ISU Stadium when Jed rode by on a bicycle with hair down his back and covered his face. And I couldn't really recognize him, except I'm sure it was the Holy Spirit that had me call his name. And he came back, asked what I was doing. And I said, well, I come over on the weekends to share Christ with the high school students and college students here on this parking lot. So I spoke with him about Christ for a few moments. We went to Burger King and shared the plan of salvation. He was really into psychology and he kept trying to rebut whatever I would state. But the Holy Spirit helped us and yet I thought that Jed was probably just joking when I said, well, you're ready to receive Christ? He said, yes. And I thought, ah, he's not ready, not with that attitude. So I said, if you're sincere, let's put your bike in the trunk of my car and move out to Raccoon Creek and I'll baptize you tonight into Christ. And so he said, okay. Well, surprisingly, we went out there and there are a few people camping there. It's probably about 12, 15, 12, 30 at night. And so I remember baptizing him into Christ and when he was risen, he extended his hands in the air, began praising God. And I said, well, maybe this is real. So we went home and my son Brad had bunk beds and he was sleeping in the top bunk and Jed was in the lower bunk. And probably about three o'clock in the morning, my little boy woke up and he looked in that bed and he saw this monster. <laughs> <laughs> and he came and jumped in my bed and said, that is a monster in my room. And at first I wondered who the monster was and I recalled it was Jed that was staying there. So Jed and I had some wonderful experiences, and then Jed was coming to our church. We would go out and share Christ, I think, probably every Monday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he kind of branched off and started speaking where he could. The rest is history. Uh, I can take just a moment to deposit a thought. I'd like for you just to consider with me today what it would be like to live in paradise. You wouldn't need EPA because the water is extremely clean. All food's organic. You never lock a door, never a pain. No fear of disease, never heard of death. All your thoughts are perfect. Most wonderful marriage. You live in this palatial palace, as it were. And everything is magnificent. It's marvelous, phenomenal, fantastic. Never one day is there a disaster, any destruction, no sorrow, no sadness. And then one day, this unusual creature speaks. And this lady responds. And upon doing so, she encourages her husband to participate with her. And at that time, paradise is lost. What's so amazing about that? 
You have a perfect couple in a perfect place, having a perfect life. And one evil thought and a few wicked words changed the course of history for humanity forever. Now if a serpent could speak to a lady, which would also cause the fall of man, and they being perfect, what hope would we have against such evil? Some people say that one of the worst things that ever happened was Adam's sin. Well, I beg to differ. The best thing that ever happened was the fall of Adam. Because Adam was a living soul. He was the first man. If he had never fallen, then we would have never had the second man. Who wasn't from the earth, but from heaven. Who was a life-giving spirit. Adam was only a living soul. We would have remained only citizens of the earth. But now you're citizens of heaven. You would have been only sons of Adam. Now you're sons of God. The best you could have ever inherited was what's on earth. But now you're heirs of Christ and joint heirs of God the Father. We have everything to be thankful for. I've learned in my life that failure is the way God works with us. We can celebrate success, but we, re we rejoice in Jesus Christ the Lord. There's nothing more exciting. He's the reason we live. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well, I need to know more about me. And I say, hell with that. I don't need to know any more about me. I already know what I was. I need to know about Him. As the Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live by faith, I live by the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. So I need to be conformed to His image, to know more about Him. Everything that fails, God will make work for us. He works things out of us, Jed, so the Holy Spirit can be more complete working in us. All things work together for good to them that love God and to those that are called according to His purpose. Uh, if you don't mind, just one more thought. Uh, everything has a name, doesn't it? All of us do. Tables, chairs, rugs, lights. If you get into anything with chemistry, medication, they name it. Sometimes we couldn't even pronounce some of the names. They did it. Every thought, every idea comes from words. We couldn't even communicate with each other without words. We're word-oriented. I can't even be saved without words because I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart God raised Him from the dead. Everything is by words. You could do nothing. I could do nothing without words. How could you have ever gotten work done, Max, without words? How could you ever be taught anything without words? It's through words we have plans. It's through words we share visions. Words. So people say, Oh, I just believe you evolved from an amoeba. Well, I can't imagine how amoeba had love or joy or peace, intelligence. Can you? And then they say it took so many billions of years for us to finally be where we are. And I said, if that's the case, why do we die at age 70? If it took so long to get this life, why do you die so soon? Seems incredible to me. So, what created us? Since words is the, are the means by which everything is done. All business, expressions of love. Nothing can be accomplished without words. Quite amazing, isn't it? It says, by the word of the Lord of the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
And then finally we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without Him was not anything made that was made, and in Him was life, and that life is the life of men. And not only that, when the Word became flesh, Wherever the word went, he could speak to the storm, peace be still. He could speak to the blind, see. To the dead, Lazarus, arise. His words are so powerful. And that by the word, we know God. By the preaching of the cross, to them that are perishing in foolishness, but to us who are saved, it's the power of God. The Word. So by the words, people are destroyed. But by words, we have life. So today I come to you, Jed, to hear John 13. To know more about the Word. Amen. And just before you speak, can I pray, please? Sure. Father, I thank you for the privilege to be with these men. That we may glorify you on earth. I thank you for the privilege to be in this home, the hospitality, the kindness. I thank you for Jed, for changing his life, for calling him to preach the glorious gospel of Christ, for Cindy, for his children, for all the people that he will yet impact, and for each of these friends that are present, that we may have influence on this earth as we realize that we are not sons of Adam, but we are sons of God and that we've called to eternally represent you on this earth. And I pray you will sanctify these moments and we will rejoice because we've had this opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name, bring health and wholeness and strength to each of us. In Christ Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. As a life of speaking on the foolishness of uh, Evolution, uh, a memory came to my mind when I got saved and started going to uh, Clyde's uh, church over in uh, Rosedale. And his parents typically would uh, pick me up on Sunday morning because I just had my bicycle, a little bit harder to ride my bicycle. So they'd pick me up and I remember, I, I suppose there was uh, maybe the second <coughs> Sunday, they picked me up and they said, well George, you know we don't believe in evolution. <laughs> of course, you know, I believe in evolution. And I, oh, I guess we don't believe in evolution. <laughs> and for that moment, I was uh, convinced that evolution, you know, was folly, was, was foolishness. And, you know, of course, they saw it in the Bible. Uh, John 13. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. When Jesus knew that his hour had come, we, we see that expression, his hour coming uh, a number of times in in the gospel according to John. We call Jesus' first miracle, turning the water into wine. And the, the, uh, his mother Mary mentioned that they were out of wine. And, and uh, uh, Jesus said, well, what is that to me? Uh, my hour is not yet come. It's, people have different opinions as, as to exactly what he was saying there. I believe she was urging him to do something and work his first miracle really and I don't know if, that Jesus had really planned at that moment to begin his miraculous ministry which you know revealed his true divinity and of course as a result of turning the water into wine the Bible says the disciples believed there was convincing to them the miracles which Jesus did so now is our come after three years to depart out of this world 
back unto the Father from whence he had come. And he's constantly reminding his disciples he had come down from heaven. Having loved his own which were in the world, and he loved them unto the end. And Jesus taught, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And of course, Clyde spoke how the devil, through the serpent, spoke to Eve and brought the downfall of man. The devil's real, and he's a deceiver, and he goes about as a roaring lion whom he might destroy. He was a murderer from the beginning, and a liar, and a bold not in the truth. We've already learned that from the Gospel according to St. John. The devil's real. He speaks to us. And I speak to the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. I rebuke the devil. We need to learn to speak to the devil because he will speak to us. He will try to deceive us. He will vex us. And we need to speak to him. And he will flee at our words. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded then cometh he to Simon Peter and Peter saith unto him Lord dost thou wash my feet do you intend to wash my feet now evidently nothing had been said already he must have washed uh, several of the disciples' feet. And he comes to Peter, and Peter objects. I think his attitude is uh, perhaps rooted in some humility that you know, this is the Son of God, uh, the Christ, the Messiah. Who are you to wash my feet? If anything, I should be washing your feet. So I think there's a humili uh, element of humility here, perhaps also an element of pride, maybe. Mm. Uh, conflicting uh, uh, thoughts in, in uh, Peter's mind that, you know, it's somewhat humbling to uh, have someone else wash your feet. As some churches practice foot washing today. Many, uh, you ever been to a church service that they had foot washings? Sure. Uh, it's not too commonplace, but uh, a number of churches still practice that today. And it's, it is a humbling experience to wash another uh, person's feet and and uh, and have your own feet washed. And of course, it was humbling on the part of Jesus because typically, who would wash the feet in those days? You come to a home, who would wash the feet? A slave, or maid, a servant, a, a lowly type person uh, would wash the feet. So here Jesus is lowering himself. Uh, and uh, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. I think maybe this is more of his pride coming forth. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, Thou hast no part in me. And Simon Peter said then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and, and my face as well. <laughs> of course, we encounter a lot of uh, Muslims on campus. The big campus we go to, there are a lot of Muslims. And uh, they typically come out to my meetings and a number of Muslims in the crowd. 
and I'll often approach it with this question. When Allah wash your feet, they say, what? I said, would Allah, your God Allah, would He wash your feet? And they find that uh, thought blasphemous, virtually. That Allah would stoop to man and wash his feet. Muslims constantly are taught to recite, God is not a father and he has no sons. There's no place uh, in the Quran where Allah is referred to as our Heavenly Father. One, we can have an intimate father-son relationship with him. That's beyond the Muslims. And so I think these Muslims have somewhat the attitude you know Peter had. That God's just too great. Uh, he's not approachable. Uh, and he doesn't approach us in an intimate way. And this is, I think, somewhat the attitude Peter had at, the, at this time. Not, not fully comprehending yet you know, the, the fullness of the Godhead uh, in Christ. And so when the Muslims uh, object, I'll say, well, well, gentlemen, that's the difference between the Allah of the Quran and the God of the Holy Bible, the God of Christianity. Our God becomes a man. And he goes up to his disciples and washes their feet. And Jesus said, Think not I come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And of course we are to serve God. But he principally came to serve mankind. And in Isaiah he's described as the suffering servant. You won't find any image or in the Quran referring to Allah as a, as a suffering servant. Allah doesn't suffer. The Allah of the Quran has no emotions. But our God has emotions. He, he sympathizes with mankind. He identifies so much with mankind that he becomes a man. And he humbles himself and washes his disciples' feet. No wonder. Isaiah 53, the great prophetic chapter, speaking of the Messiah that is to come. No wonder Isaiah starts off with the question, who has believed our report? Who could believe such a report? That God would become a man and humble himself, wash his disciples' feet, and then willingly go to the cross to atone for the sins of mankind. As Isaiah describes in that wonderful chapter, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So that's one thing I want to get across, of course, to the students, and we need to all understand. This is the revelation of God's character. God is a God of humility. And he's trying to teach, basically, humility to his disciples here. And what he knows is his last meeting together. And this is the third year of us meeting weekly. And afterwards, we don't have supper, but we do have breakfast. And, uh, you know, what if, you know, be, to me, it would be a sad occasion uh, if we were to have our last meeting or one of us were, were to part, depart and uh, not meet together anymore because generally speaking, everybody's there in town faithful uh, to, uh, to come to the meetings. Except when Max sleeps in. <laughs> okay. Uh, Verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. 
And you're clean, but you're not all clean. So evidently he understands that they perhaps have bathed before coming to this Last Supper. But they're walking around in the dusty city streets and with sandals and their feet get dirty. So they were basically clean except their feet got dirty. And sometimes as we go out in the world, we might get our feet a little dirty by being influenced by the world. And so, you know, we, but there's cleansing available uh, for us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're clean, but not all of you. <coughs> Who's the unclean one here? Judas. Judas, the unclean one. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So obviously, Jesus, as he does so often, takes a temporal matter, an earthly matter, a matter and is trying to convey a spiritual truth through something as simple as commonplace as washing feet. He's one to illustrate it. The real cleansing is the cleansing of the heart. He wants us to have a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We want to have pure motives. And to have a pure heart is a heart that loves God. And loves God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And we love our neighbor as ourself. We love our enemy. We bless those that curse us. We do good to those that hate us. We pray for those who despitefully use us. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Do you know what I have done? You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. And of course, this is why some churches practice. It's, you know, part of their ritual, maybe every several months. I think some of them just maybe practice it once a year, I don't know. But uh, from the scripture, they'll have a foot washing ceremony. I don't think that's really necessary, but the idea is you serve. And, uh, but we are to have this idea of serving one another and humbling one another. Uh, or, I mean, being humble enough to serve one another. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. You know, Sturgis will frequently say, well, who do you think you are, Jesus? I said, well, he's our example. We are to be Christ-like. And we are to be Christ-like in character. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither, have that, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So to hear it, to hear the gospel is one thing. To obey the gospel is another. We're to obey it. Uh, we're not just, James said, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Do it. You know, faith without works is dead. I'll show you my faith by my works. The works do not save us, but the works are the evidence uh, that we have been saved. This, the heart of a servant are the evidence that we have been saved. We have been delivered. We have been set free. And that's where true happiness is. It comes through serving others. Living for others. And that's when we generally feel best about ourselves and feel good about ourselves when we've done something to help others that cost us something. But at the end of the day, we have a sense of well-being, a clear conscience. And, uh, we made a difference today. 
and then think of the times. Uh, hopefully it's all in the past when we've all taken advantage of someone, exploited someone, you know, we feel bad about ourselves. You know, Jay, I just think of people that bring others into their homes and make them sons or daughters. My mother did that with a young man named Donnie Melvin at the orphanage. Uh -huh. I think of, of Vern Gibson bringing Larry Lowe into your home, making him as your brother, treating him with, my goodness, and you thought of Larry, you just thought of Max. Yeah. And when we were playing, I mean, you guys were just, that's quite a powerful thing when you bring someone into your home and say, your family. As Jesus Christ has brought us into his home and said, your family. It's really a, a wonderful thing in serving others and giving our life that others may benefit from it. Yeah. Amen. Verse 18, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. This is a uh, verse taken from Psalm 41, verse 9, it's prophetic. Uh, Jesus will be uh, betrayed. Keep in mind this Lord's Supper, what had, what had been going on uh, during this supper evidently, and I think that's what really prompted Jesus uh, to wash his disciples' feet. Maybe he planned to do so anyway, I suppose, but uh, the disi disciples, according to Luke's account, of, uh, uh, of the Lord's Supper had been arguing with one another. Mm -hmm. Who, anybody remember what they were arguing about? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And so that what is what prompted the foot washing. Who's the, who is the greatest? He that serves is the greatest. And that's what makes our God the greatest God. Far superior to Allah or any of these other gods uh, that religions promote, because our God serves humanity. And then we in turn serve Him out of love for Him. Or should be uh, serving Him out of love for Him. Not principally out of, you know, it was the fear of God, the threat of hell that got Clyde's attention. And that'll get our attention. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But then God wants us to take his place where we serve him, we believe in him, we obey him. Not principally because we fear hell and hope for heaven, but because we love him. And we love our neighbor. And fear is a strong force to keep us straight. Mm -hmm. But if we just have the fear of God, that probably won't keep us straight. That's right. But when we've got the love of God, love is such a powerful force, Jesus is teaching, that it enables us, it strengthens us yeah. to, to uh, stay great. You know, if you just don't commit adultery because you're afraid of getting caught by your wife or exposed by the community or whatever, that might not be enough to restrain you. But if you, of course, if you love your wife, you, you'll be faithful to her. Uh, you know, other women will not be a, a significant temptation if you really uh, love your spouse. And when we really love God, it's not difficult to obey Him. The Bible says, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. 1 John 5 and 3. And His commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're not difficult. When we love Him, However, if we merely fear Him, if we merely fear the consequences of sin, uh, well, it can't get difficult. And we'll probably sooner or later be overcome with sin. But love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. As long as we're walking in love, it won't fail us. Why did 
David uh, fail and commit adultery? Well, I think his heart had grown cold against God before he ever observed Bathsheba on the rooftop. His heart had grown cold. He wasn't out there in the battle doing service like he, he was supposed to be doing. Uh, Verse 19. Now I tell you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am He. I am He. Who? Who's the He? Well, He says that you may believe that I am He. Who's the He's referring to? I am the Almighty. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the Almighty. He is the one that spoke to Moses in the burning bush and said, I am, that I am, I am He. He's affirming His deity here. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. You know, I'm very thankful for this verse 20. Because, you know, Christians ought to know this verse. You talk about hospitality. Take it in orbits. I go all over this country, people take me into their homes. And sometimes people that just know me maybe by reputation, uh, which might cause someone to fear a little bit, I don't know, but, but, uh, or be reluctant, but uh, uh, some I just, you know, lay here on town, and first time they've ever met me, maybe I go to their church and they invite me into their home. Might spend a week with them. You know, a lot of people go through life, I've discovered, and never have anybody, even an overnight guest in their home. I think that's not so unusual. But he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. And we're sent. Jesus said, As the Father sent me, so send I you. And that's how <laughs> I've been able to stay on the road, no offering place on campus or anything. And because of you know so many people we've met in our travels over the year going from campus town to campus town. And uh, they receive us, and then some of these people become financial uh, supporters of the ministry as well. And it's you know based on this verse, really, people understanding this principle, and uh, you know other verses as well. Uh, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, "Verily, verily, I say unto you." One of you shall betray me. All right. We all know this painting, don't we? Leonardo da Vinci. The Last Supper. Now this uh, Leonardo uh, started painting this in 1495. Completed it in 1498. Now this painting is not in a museum. It's not in an art museum. It's hanging in a church. It, well, it's not hanging. It's painted on a wall in uh, a church in Milan, Italy. And uh, you say, well, this, this picture looks kind of faded. Well, the real thing is real faded. This is, you know, hundreds of years old. And they say some of the, it's been, you know, redone by uh, professionals a number of times uh, over the centuries. Uh, they say some of the real paint still exists. I don't know. I, I can't question that. Perhaps it does. But, you know, the Catholics are pretty famous for their relics and, and uh, that sort of thing has become almost a, a, a relic. But uh, um, there's a lot of interesting symbolism uh, in here. Uh, what are the three windows in the back symbolized, would you say? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And notice the, the groups, how the disciples are in groups of three. Three, six, nine, and twelve. Again, a reminder uh, of the Trinity. Now, there's 
uh, Jesus, and if you notice the figure of Jesus is more or less in a triangle. Again, the triangle is uh, representative of, of, uh, of the Trinity. You didn't know I was an art critic, did you? So, uh, and, uh, so who can identify uh, some of the disciples there? Some of them should there, there's some uh, uh, clues there. It's kind of hard to see, I realize, because this painting is uh, rather faded. But uh, John close by, isn't he? Uh, yeah, now this is uh, John right here. He's about talks about how John leaned on, on Jesus' breast. But you know what's well, one thing I don't like about this. First of all, Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter. They didn't have power tools in those days. You know, he would have been a rugged man. And uh, no, uh, th this picture is a little bit too effeminate for me. And look at John there. Even more so. John and his brother, uh, James, two fishermen. And again, you know, fishermen, you know, they had to you know, pull in those fish and those nets and so on. That's hard work. They would have been uh, muscular men too. They wouldn't have been, you know, soft. And what were the nicknames of, uh, of, of these two brothers? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. Well, you're not going to call it some pansy type. <laughs> a, a, a son of thunder. But so there are aspects of this painting I don't like, but then there are good aspects to it. I think the ex expressions uh, on their faces is good and it's revealing. I think it's highly unlikely, you know, they sat at the table like this. You know, this is to get the message across. You know, if there was a round table or a rectangular table when the people on each side, you'd just see the backs. Some of the they were been reclining. Yeah, yeah. That's what they. That's how they. They were reclining. All right. Uh, you see, uh, right here is uh, Judas. Notice Judas is lower than any of them, and he's got a bag in his hand. What's that bag represent? The, yeah, the 30 purses of silver that he betrays Jesus with. Or some have suggested maybe it's also an allusion to the fact that what was Judas' uh, uh, main job in, in, on Jesus? What we, we call his staff today. Uh, the treasure. Yeah, he was the treasure. So Which one is he? He carried the bag right here. Uh, right here. That's Judas. Okay. And. Uh, Notice, one of them has a knife. Who do you suppose has the knife? Peter. Peter has the knife. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is Peter right here, next to John. You can see, it's hard to see there, but you'd expect it. You can see the knife. He's kind of got it behind him. You know, he might be ready to attack this guy right now. Who is it betray him? And this guy's not going to get out of here alive. And uh, and then uh, of course, when did Peter use that knife? Cut the guy's ear off. Cut the guy's ear off when they came to to uh, arrest Jesus. Yeah. So uh, let's see. This is uh, I think th this is supposed to be uh, um, James, uh, the brother of John here. He is portrayed as a more rugged man. The finger up. That's significant. That should give you a clue that one has his finger up right here. Uh, so who do you think that would be? Thomas. Pardon? Thomas. Thomas. And why did why did you say that? Why is the finger significant? Because the doubting maybe or the Yeah, and doubting Thomas. You know, he sticks his finger and he's not gonna believe until he sees the nail prints in his hand and puts his Finger in the side where uh, they thrust the sword into Jesus, one of the Roman soldiers, and uh, and already you know he's you know questioning probably Jesus. You know he's he's always questioning, them. and uh, um, this is uh, 
supposed to be Philip. You know, he's probably pleading with Jesus or wanting more information. And, uh, uh, John has a look of exasperation on his face. And this is Simon the Zealot. What, were, what was he zealous, zealous for? The Zealots, what were they known for? Rebellion against Rome. Yeah, they were the rebels, always ready to fight and, and uh, very political. And so here is, uh, I, I think, uh, Matthew and one of the other disciples. You know, they're questioning, well, Simon, do you know anything about this? You know, he's into political intrigue and that sort of thing. So, what, what's going on here? Some sort of cons conspiracy or what? So uh, there's a lot to... However, one thing quite interesting is they didn't really know themselves who they were by saying, is it I? Right. right. I, I still find that kind of amazing. Even questioning themselves, is it I that will betray you? And here's one of them, you see, it's kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe they fear one of them will. And who knows? You know, Peter or, or Judas succumbed to the temptation, but some of the other disciples could have well been tempted. Thank God they did not give in to the temptation, but they maybe had been tempted to betray Jesus themselves. Because they still had in mind, you know, this. What's all this talk about death? My hour is come. Uh, you know, they were still looking for a Messiah that would come, and uh, they were under uh, occupation of the Romans, and get rid of the Romans, bring them victory, and, uh, uh, ruling and reigning. So, in verse uh, 21. Uh, 22. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Who would that be? Of course, John. Uh, you know, that was, he was part of the, evidently, the inner circle uh, that Jesus had, especially close to, to John and Peter. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. So maybe John was kind of the spokesman. You know, uh, because he was very close. It was Clyde, you know, Charlotte, well, when we were growing up, uh, somehow the, the girls got the attitude that uh, Charlotte was my favorite. Uh, I didn't particularly have a favorite. So if they wanted something from Dad, Charlotte was supposed to be the spokesman <laughs> because Charlotte was probably the one to be able to convince me to let them do this, you know, that I might be reluctant to, to let them do something. And so Charlotte was supposed to be the spokesman. And so maybe John was kind of the spokesman here. Uh, we need more information. Uh, John, you talk to Jesus. We need more information. Who's going to betray him? What's happening? Uh, he then lying on Jesus' breast, saying unto him, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it unto Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And you can see Jesus, you know, his hands reached out here, uh, you know, to the bread and the wine. One, his hand is open, the other, his hand is shut, the other, his hand is open. But I wonder, what is it about uh, the, this account of the Lord's Supper that uh, John's account is different than the account of the Lord's Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? What's the difference? Something left out here. Well, Holy Communion. You know, he doesn't, John doesn't bring out the Holy Communion, you know, sharing, actually sharing the, the wine, the blood. Uh, but John evidently wrote his gospel last. And he lived the longest. And, and uh, so John covers things that that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't cover. I mean, if they all cover the same thing and you say exactly the same thing, why have four, four accounts? So uh, 
John brings in uh, some things that the the uh, others do not. The foot washing is what he brings in. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention the foot washing uh, connected with the Lord's Supper. And after the saw, Satan entered into him. First, Satan put it into his heart to betray him. And now, Satan actually evidently possesses Judas. And he's gone beyond the point of no return. Evidently now. Satan has actually possessed him. And, uh, and after the saw, Satan entered him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do it quickly. He's, Jesus is now resigned to going to the cross. Uh, now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So, you know, Jesus still doesn't let everybody know who the traitor is. Evidently, John must have heard it. And if you notice the expression on John, he's got kind of the expression leaning back, you know, accepting it reluctantly. Um, and then, you know, understanding that this is the end. <coughs> Of course, the end in Christianity is death. Is the, our beginning, really, and His beginning, His resurrection. It's not truly an end, but it seems to be at this time. Uh, verse thirty. He then, having received the saw, went immediately out, and it was night. Bad things happen at night. I think that's when Satan does most of his work at night. Uh, therefore when he was gone out Jesus said now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him and God's glorified in the cross isn't that amazing who would lead our report God is glorified in suffering God is glorified in, 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 in shame humility his whole life was was one of humility, even becoming a man. That's how God is glorified. And God's glorified when we suffer for His sake. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and hate you and say all matter of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice! And be exceedingly glad. We're so persecuted the prophets before you. It's one thing to talk about the gospel. It's one thing to speak of the death of Christ. But when we take a the kind of stand we want ought to be taking, when the church takes the kind of stand we ought to be taking, people will want to kill us. They don't want to get rid of us. But we have an opportunity to reveal to the world then the death of Christ as we continue to love our enemies. Bless those that curse us. Do good to those that hate us. So it's one thing to talk about the cross. That's not going to convince, we'll convince some to hear a good sermon on the cross. But we got to see it lived out in our lives as we, as we suffer for the cause of Christ. He's, he's revealed unto the world. Verse 33, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, A new commandment I give unto you, that you should love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But well, didn't uh, Leviticus say, uh, you know, Deuteronomy says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the book of Leviticus chapter 19 says, Love your neighbor as yourself. Now the Old Testament teaches that. Well, how is this a new commandment then? It's not really new, is it? We find it in Leviticus. In what sense is it new? Because it's fleshed out now in the love of Christ. 
that Christ really shows us what it means. Unlike, you know, that Adam's sin gave Christ the opportunity, God the opportunity to show him, reveal, really reveal his character, really reveal his nature to us by sending his son into the world. Humbling the Son, humbling the Father. And so it's new in that Jesus shows us what it really means. You know, and we how do we express this? It, it can just be in our family interaction with our husband or wife. Husbands, love your wives how? Even as Christ loved the church and gave him so forth. Face when a mother coming up. I mean, think about that. That's a, yeah. that's a powerful statement. <laughs> because then so many women are becoming so hard to kill their babies these days. Yeah. Um, and so it's by this all men shall know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. So. You know, God's love is revealed through our actions. You know, words are important. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That is, they see the Word activated in our lives. That's what's really going to convince the world that we have the true religion. They're constantly asking me, well, why is your religion better than others? Because our religions are not love. And just love is manifest. Manifest through His church. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. The church is the light of the world. Simon said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? And Jesus answered him, whither I go? Simon said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Or where are you going? He still doesn't really get it. And no, it's understandable. Jesus answered him, whither I go, you cannot follow me now. Like the word now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards or later. And what does church tradition tells us what happens to Peter in Rome? He's crucified upside down. Initially, he flees Rome, church tradition, and then he sees Jesus in a vision as he's walking the Appian Way out of Rome. And he says, uh, uh, Quo vas? Remember the movie Phobotus? Means, uh, uh, where are you going, Lord? Peter asked. And Jesus, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. Well, Peter's really convicted. And so Peter goes back to Rome. And of course, he's immediately arrested. And then he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And you, know, you hang me upside down. So, he wasn't quite ready for that yet, though. I mean, he, he denies the Lord. He's not ready for it. Yeah, he thinks he is, but he's not. And uh, he says, oh, and Peter says, Lord, why can't I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Well, he's speaking prophetically, but he's not ready yet to do it. He thinks he is, but God's still going to do a work in him. And Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me twice. Thankfully, Peter repents. But Judas goes out and hangs himself. Judas' soul is damned. Peter's soul with horses saved. Bo, would you ask the blessing on the food and conclude our study and prayer, please?